What's up, everybody? Welcome to Transition Tuesdays. For this Tuesday, November 17th, 2020, I am your host, Russ Williams. I'm so glad you could be here today. I'm quite aware you could have been anywhere in this world today. I know you could have been anywhere in this world today, but you decided to be here with me, and I appreciate that. And more importantly, I appreciate you. So welcome to Transition Tuesdays, ladies and gentlemen, on this Fally weather here in New York City on November 17th, 2020. Uh, guys, we have an action-packed show here today. Um, I got a special guest on the line here. We're going to talk to her as well. But before I do that, I love to sp talk about my intentions for the show. And it's never changes, never worries, never worries, never wavies. Or wa oh, I don't know what I'm saying. But here's what I'm saying about, the, about my intentions. My intention is to give you the opportunity to laugh, smile, think, and engage in honest conversations about your life's transition. So that's what we do here on Transition Tuesdays. And speaking of honest conversation, I have on the hotline of Transition Tuesdays my special guest. Special guest, are you there? I am here. All right, all right. Now, special guest, I'm going to bring you out the right way. I have this extensive bio that I have for this young lady and I want to read this to the guys to everybody so they could be familiar with my special guest now my special guest is a basketball legend at Collingswood High School where she averaged 20 points per game her senior year she scored over a thousand points in her high school career and won a state basketball title in 1986 man that's big now she is a Jasper legend as she was uh, in 1989 and 1990, she was the Metropolitan Player of the Year her senior year at Manhattan College. She was, she was the fifth 1,000-point scorer in the Manhattan College program history, and she currently ranks number nine with 1,217 points, career points. We're going to talk about each and every one of those today. <laughs> she was named MVP of the 1990 MAC Tournament. Uh, after she recorded, now check out this for a stat sheet stuffer, ladies and gentlemen. She recorded 17 points, 9 assists, 7 rebounds against Holy Cross in the championship game. She is one of Manhattan College student athletes uh, in program history to play in two, not one, but two MAC championship teams. And she is the only player to score in two NCAA tournament games. Man, she is a, I'll tell you what else she has, another thing on about her resume. She is a Manhattan College, Collingswood High School, and a Mac Hall of Famer. All right, she has done all that. Oh, my God. Now, also, she went on the coach, too. She's a, She coached for 10 years at Loyola of Maryland and Indiana State, and she is now a sales executive rep at Lillian Company. Transition Army, please help me welcome Miss Donna Sebo to Transition Tuesdays. Donna, welcome. Thanks, Russ. I'm so excited to be here with you. Let's <laughs> find those talks. Oh, I'm excited to have you on there too. Let me let me see real quick. Let's see who's tuning in. We got Joseph Walters. We got JoJo Walters, one of Manhattan College's finest to ever play in Manhattan College, joining us today. We also got Karen Stewart joining. What's going on, Karen? Welcome to Transition Tuesdays, everybody. Man, I tell you, Don, I would, did I, I hope I did your, your resume justice there. I mean, you had a lot of accomplishments there. We're, we're going to talk about those there today. Now, Donna, a couple of things now. I like to make my guests feel welcome and I play music for my guests. So I'm going to play this song for you, Donna. Maybe hopefully you, uh -oh. you remember, this, you remember this tune. And when I hear this song, I, I could just I could just visualize in Donna maybe like, you know, maybe down in Broadway, maybe like was it like down there? Characters was down there, the Pinewood was down there, right? And, and I think I, I <laughs> And I think this song might have came on and I, I just see Donna dancing to the song. So Donna, I want you to take a listen to this song. Tell me what you think, okay? Hold on one second, let's get it together, cue it up. Oh, <laughs> Do you remember that one, Donna? I think we may have outplayed that song all my four years in college, no doubt. I know, right? Oh, man, I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh, my God. That was Brown Eyed Girl by 
Van Morrison. Man, hey, question for you, Donna. Well, first of all, when I heard that song, I always thought that was Mick Jagger. I didn't know that was a Van Morrison. I didn't know who that was. He sounded like so much like Mick Jagger to me. I don't know. Sonic sounds a little bit like him, but he's got a little bit more of a uh, unique voice to him, you know? Yes, uh-huh, yep. And why why is that song like the theme, like for the end of the night, that one and Sweet Caroline? But I know, but a lot of people like used to get up, you know, dance and stuff, dance on bars, you know, on the bar and stuff like that. I've seen that a number of times when this song came on. Why do you think that was the case for this particular song? Well, I don't know. I think by the end of the night, we had had a few in us and we were just ready to dance. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Now, Donna, I'm going to play you one more song, all right? Now... Uh, this is a song in which I can visualize Donna like she's at a sporting event. And this song comes on, and I can just see Donna just dancing to this one. So let me, let me play this one for you, Donna. Tell me what you think. One second. All right. All right. Oh, my God. <laughs> do you even know this song? I totally do. Keep it going. Let it go. Let it go. Okay, okay. We're going to let it go. All right, maybe we'll dance to it. Let me see. Let me see if I can remember the dance to this song. Okay, let me see. All right, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. All right, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. What? You are showing my age. Oh, we're going to still let it play. I love it. Jump on it. Jump on it. All right, one more verse. We'll give one more play. <laughs> that is a classic. Thank <laughs> goodness we didn't have that song on our warm-up tape, though. I know, right? Oh, my God, man. And that was, as we know, that was the Sugar Hill Gang, Apache. Oh, my God. Yeah. Great song. Great song. <laughs> oh, my God. Let's see who else we got. We got, we got Angela. Joining, what's going on, Angela Potenza? Oh my God, I haven't saw, seen Angela in years. What's going on, Angela? Welcome to Transition Tuesdays. We got President O'Connell joining us here from Manhattan College. Welcome, welcome, guys. Welcome, everybody, to Transition Tuesdays as we're checking on with Donna. We also got Chris Smooth Williams, Uncle Smoothie, joining us. What's going on? <laughs> we also got Brian Burns joining us. What's going on, Brian? Tell Mr. Burns I said hello. Oh my God, we got it. We got man. I tell you, hey Donna, you bringing everybody out? Bro, I tell you, I love it. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, Donna, a couple of things that you know. I just asked a couple of questions for you. Know we just having a conversation, which is great. What do you, you know, I just, I'll be remiss if I didn't ask, you know, how are you and your family doing and coping with these three pandemics going on? You know, we got COVID-19, we got the economy, and we also got the social injustice around our country. But how are you and your family coping with all that? Well, you know, it, it, it is, I'm not going to lie and say it's been great. Mm -hmm. um, it is a little, you know, frustrating. Luckily, I have a job that, you know, I can continue working. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife, her job is in education, so she's safe with that. Okay. So um, we, we have been lucky from that standpoint as mm -hmm. far as um, still being able to work and not really be affected by the COVID okay. um, that's going on with all the shutdowns and the cases that are rising here in New Jersey right now. Right. Uh, it, it, yeah. You know, it's been, it's been frustrating. I'm not going to lie. I enjoy getting out as part of my my job as a pharmaceutical rep and going into offices and seeing people and talking right. to doctors. And right now I can't do that. I can only do it over the phone because right. my company, Eli Lilly has really done a phenomenal job during this whole time of keeping us safe and healthy and knowing when to put the brakes on and give us a red zone, you know, mm -hmm. where we can't go out to mm -hmm. offices. Um, and then when the numbers went down for a little while, uh, a couple months ago, we actually had some, a green light to go out. Uh, but even then, we still had some offices that wouldn't let us in. So I, yeah. I've been trying to not only consider that, that I'm going through it, but there's a lot of people out there going through this, this COVID time right now. So I really try to respect them, yeah. their time, their offices, and the patients, and, and just make sure I'm not overwhelming them with much. But, uh, you know, it, it's... It's, it's, it's some trying times, but I think there's a light at the end of the tunnel here. Yes, absolutely. And I agree with you as well. Definitely agree with you on that, Donna. We got Jay Edna Nola, Nolan joining us. What's going on, Jay Edna? Welcome to Transition Tuesdays. Love having you. Um, so now, Donna, now, uh, speaking of, well, we haven't even spoken about, but 
Did your candidate win the presidential election? Of course he did. Okay. Yes, he did, thank goodness. I don't know if I could have done another four years. Uh, yeah, I'm with you on that. <laughs> I, have my pa- I have my passport all up to date just in case I needed to do anything if something else happened. <laughs> <laughs> I hate I just it. just a decent person in there, someone who cares about us, yeah. and we'll do the right thing. That's yeah. all I wanted. And, um, you know, I, I think... You know, Joe Biden is that person, and Kamala Harris, which is phenomenal. Talk about, yeah. you know, shattering the glass ceiling of, of a woman now being yeah. that high in the government. Um, yeah. You know, I, I wanted Hillary back four years ago. That would have been phenomenal. Right. But what what an amazing um, accomplishment this is for, for Kamala Harris to not only be a woman, but be a black woman mm-hmm. and, and being this high in government and what a role model she's going to be for so many people. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. She's a role model. I mean, I got two daughters of my own, so she's a role model. I can, you know, my daughters can do anything now. This tells, this lets them know they can do totally. anything. Anything is possible. Yep. Yeah. Yep. yep. We got Ron DeClario joining us, man. We got a high school coaching Hall of Famer joining us here from Cardoza High School. We also got John Lee, one of our Jasper brothers, joining. What's going on, John? What's going on, Ron? Welcome to Transition Tuesdays. So, Donna, now I want to I want to take us back a little bit. So, I want to talk about I want to talk about little Donna growing up in Jersey. Okay, now, <laughs> so let's let's yep, let's rewind to that. So, um, you know, did did you? Did you ha- do you have any siblings, Donna, or were you the only child? Or actually, yes, I do. I have a an older sister, okay. an older brother, and I've actually got a twin sister, really? uh, who is three minutes older than me. So technically, she's my older sister too. Wow! Um, and I'm the baby of the family by three minutes. Well, I didn't know that. I had no idea, Donna. <laughs> yeah. Man, yeah. now how, did, was it a lot of like competitiveness like civil rivalry like uh like did you uh, did you guys grow up playing sports in your household or yeah you know my brother and i i really learned you know a lot of uh, a lot of my athletic background was from my brother he was a very good athlete in high school and when we were younger my mm-hmm. twin sister played uh, tennis and softball with me in high school mm-hmm. wasn't much of an athlete and then in the in the winter time she was a cheerleader okay. so we really didn't you know have a whole lot of competition um between us as far as athletics was concerned Mm-hmm. Um, but we had our, you know, your typical sibling competitiveness and being a twin growing up, it was wonderful. Cause I always had somebody with me in, you know, going to school for the first day of school. Right. Uh, right. Which was always really nice for me. And, uh, you know, I, I grew up, you know, in a small town in, 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 um, New Jersey, Oakland, mm. New Jersey, right across from Philadelphia. Okay. Uh, we, I went to a small, you know, middle school and then, you know, even going to college with high school. It wasn't one of the bigger schools in the state of New Jersey. You know, New Jersey has four different groups, four being the largest. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was in high school, we were in group two. So, um, you know, so that was a little bit lower in the pack as far as the sizes of schools. But mm-hmm. it was it was perfect. My parents went to Collingswood High School when they were younger. So it just kind of was a great transition for all of us to go through Collingswood. You know, after my parents, I actually had a Spanish teacher that was my, my, my mom and dad had when they were in high school. Wow. So, by the time I got there, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it was it was wonderful growing up around here and mm-hmm. and um, you know being back in the area, living back in the area after being away from coaching and and everything. It's great seeing people again. I'm seeing you know classmates, people from you know all different years I went to high school with, and it's it just it's it's great. I love it. Mm, that's great. Now, did all your brothers and sisters? Did you all go to the same high school? Yes, we did. We all. Uh, my older sister went to um, a, a different school for a year and then went back to Collingswood. But yeah, we all graduated from Collingswood High School. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. We we got Bob Mohalen joining us. What's going on, Bob? We also got Annette joining us from the D. What up, D? What up, though? From the D. <laughs> hey, and Annette, also, I want to, uh, my thoughts and prayers, my, my, my uh, prayers are with you and your daughter. I, I got your text message earlier on that. My thoughts and prayers are with you, my love. Now, so, so, Don, let's talk about high school, okay? Collingswood High School. Now, yeah. tell me, how was it, what was the feeling like winning a state championship? That was your senior year, correct? Yes, that was my senior year. Well, it was, it was, it was like, I felt like we were building to that. So um, my middle school went to ninth grade. So unfortunately, when I was in the ninth grade, we had a, a, a basketball team at the Oakland Junior High that I was at. So I could not play it. So I technically only had three varsity years in basketball over at Collingswood. Okay. I wasn't able to go over to Collingswood my freshman year to play um, tennis. Mm-hmm. 
So, because we didn't have a tennis team. So, but unfortunately, we had basketball and softball in Oakland. So, mm. I missed out on two years of varsity basketball and softball. But my sophomore year in high school, and, and you know, Rush, you're gonna you're gonna know how this is because you played basketball in high school. You uh-huh. stayed in the metropolitan area up there, so you probably ran into a lot of guys you played against mm-hmm. in high school. Yep. My sophomore year, um, when I went over there, we had a we had a decent season. Uh, again, we were in Group 2, so we went to the Group 2 um, finals, mm-hmm. and we actually played Delran High School, which was one of the, you know, a, a, a school not too far from us. Well, Chris Saka, who played at Fairfield, mm-hmm. um, was a freshman when I was a sophomore, so that was my first <laughs> kind of introduction to Chris Saka, and we ended up beating them mm. in um, in uh, overtime. I hit the shot to send us into overtime, and then I hit the winning shot to win the game. So wait, oh, no, uh, let's not gloss over that fact, not Donna. So you hit the <laughs> you hit those two game you hit those two game winners. No problem. Yeah, yeah. As a sophomore, and I was a little dork too, Russ. I had my glasses <laughs> on because I hadn't gotten contacts yet. Um, <laughs> so that kind of started the rivalry, which was great with Trisaka. So. My junior year, we, we, we moved up to group three for that year for some reason. I don't know why. We must have gotten a few more, you know, some more students at the school. But uh-huh. I, th- I forget how far we made it there. But our senior year, there was a, there was a, a core four of us okay. that were seniors together. And Gene Mooney was the other player on my team that actually played um, Division One basketball at Lehigh University. Wow, okay. Nice. So we actually played each other when I got to Manhattan. But our senior year um, – of course, our goal was to win the state championship. We knew we were that good as a team. And mm-hmm. we had Gene on the inside. We had me on the outside. Mm-hmm. And then we had such great role players that, as a team, we knew we could go far in the state championship game. Mm-hmm. Midway through the season, um, we had a rivalry with a local Catholic school, Paul the Six. Okay. That Karen Robinson, who went to Notre Dame, played at. Um, Sherry Andrew Levitch, who played at Lehigh with Gene Mooney. Mm-hmm. Um, they had some great Division One players, too, and we lost to them at Collins with that team our senior year. Well, that next day of practice, you know how it is, Russ. Man, oh. our coach ran us, like, oh, you yeah. know, to no end. Yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. No balls on the court. We were just <laughs> running. Uh-huh. And I feel, to this day, had we not lost that game, we would have never won the state championship, and we ended up going 28-1 that year. Wow. And in the state championship, we played at Rutgers University, and we played Harrison, New Jersey, who had Alice Burgess, who played at Wagner. So I ended up, you know, seeing her later in my career at Manhattan as well when we played Wagner. And we beat – it took double overtime to beat um, Harrison at Rutgers my senior year to win the state championship. And it was, you know – it was just the best feeling in the world. I mean, you're, you're, that's the, you know, at high school, that's the highest level you can get to as a high school basketball player. Definitely. And yeah. all that hard work that we did during the season, that one loss that we had that we were devastated over, uh, just took us to that level that senior year. And it was just, it was amazing to, to you know, we're going to go down in history in the state of New Jersey, but also at my high school, there has been no other state championship girls basketball team, and there probably never will be. Wow. That is impressive. That is so impressive. We got Tariq Thacker, one of one of the Jasper's famous, uh, famous and finest ever to play at Manhattan College, joining us today. What's up, Tariq? Welcome to Transition Tuesdays. Hey, and, and Donna, now I don't want you to gloss over this fact. Now I've, I've been doing a lot of research on you, Donna. Now I heard like during that championship game, <laughs> during that championship game, you had like a bullseye pass to the player for you guys to win that game. Is that true? So yeah. you had your hand in it in the game in the in the winner. Yep, and I still remember it, Russ. You know, it's amazing how you can remember everything from games, right? Yes. Um, and as a pharmaceutical rep, sometimes I can't remember the percentages of how our <laughs> drug is better than another drug. Right, um, yep. <laughs> but I can, I can totally remember that pass. We, we, had, um, uh, we were down two, and there was only literally about 10 seconds to go in the game. Mm-hmm. And the ball was thrown into me, and I just started dribbling down the court. Well, meanwhile, and of course we find this out later, my high school coach, John Bach, uh-huh. Um, whose father coached in the NBA for a very, very long time. And his father, uh, John Bach Sr., coached Michael Jordan with the Chicago Bulls. Wow. So he has that basketball knowledge. He was one of the best basketball coaches I've ever played for. Mm. He was on the sideline trying to call timeout. And thank goodness I didn't see him because we just kept running down. And then all of a sudden I saw Gene <laughs> kind of running down to the left of me. And I just like threw this pass in between two players, a nice bounce pass. 
perfectly where she just grabbed it, laid it in, and we went into overtime. Man, man. So, so I, I take it you had your contacts in this time. You had your glasses. That way you didn't see them? <laughs> yeah, there were no glasses my senior year, Russ. I got rid of them. I told my mom, if I can hit the face one more time with a ball, my glasses break. I'm not, I don't know what I'm going to do. So after, thank goodness, my sophomore year, I got my, my contact lenses. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. We got Brenda joining us from the D. What up, though? What up, though, cuz? Welcome to Transition Tuesdays. Love having everybody, each and everybody here. And if you just joined us, we're talking to Donna Sebo, one of the legends of Manhattan College. Man, to ever play. At Manhattan College, no doubt about that, man. Oh man, oh man. Hey, so Donna, so let's 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 continue on our our journey here about Donna. This is like Donna. This is your life here today, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so Donna, talk. Oh well, before I get into like your college days at Manhattan College, now I know you played two uh, two other sports. You played tennis and softball. Was yeah. basketball was that your favorite sport, or were you the best at basketball? Or were you or were you pretty good at the other two sports as well in high school? <laughs> the other two sports too but i knew to be able to go to college i needed to get the scholarship okay uh, i came from a you know a middle class lower middle class family four mm-hmm. kids yeah. uh my parents worked you know blue collar jobs so yeah. it's not like they were you know making a whole lot of money so i knew i had to get a scholarship to be able to you know go to the next level right and uh you know um that's when you know when i started getting letters and and my high school coach started talking to me you know, about, you know, the different schools that were interested. I mean, I was I was just so flattered, of course. And then, um, you know, I just was like, okay, well, this, this means I'm going to be able to get to that next level and get a very good education. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know how it is, Russ, as a, as a fellow recruit, you know, yeah. coming out of high school, you just kind of weigh your options. You mm-hmm. know, my final choices were actually between Manhattan and Fairfield. Oh, okay, great. Uh, I was going to ask you about your, your, your recruiting process. So those were the, those yeah. were the final two? Yep, they were the final two. I went to visit Boston University, but I was like, nope, that was just way too far for me. And I went down to Furman University mm-hmm. in South Carolina, and that was way too far. <laughs> uh, but Diane Nolan was a, a fellow New Jersey, you know, Gloucester Catholic girl right in the next town over from me. Uh-huh. So that kind of had, I already had like a connection with her. And then, of course, my coach, Kathy Solano. And yes. Room, they recruited me very, very heavily, and when I went to both schools to visit, uh, Manhattan was for me. I knew as a player I would become a much, much better player under Coach Solano mm-hmm. uh, because she was one of the, you know, she was on one of those first NBA teams of the women's league yeah. back in the day, right. and so I knew um, that she had that competitive edge that I really wanted to play for. Mm. So that's how I was that's how I chose Manhattan. It really came down, you know, they, as a coach, it was funny. I was told players, don't choose schools because of coaches because you never know if they're going to stay. And I did that, right. you know, yeah. <laughs> um, when I was looking at different colleges. But um, Manhattan was perfect for me. It was where I wanted to be. It was close enough to home but far enough away. And um, and it was like a family atmosphere for me. So I just I fell in love with it the second I walked on campus. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Hey, Donna, full disclosure. Now, I'm, I'm going to give something up here today. Full disclosure on Coach Solano. Yeah. My, myself and my former teammate, Jim, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Nightingale, we used to have the biggest crush on Coach Solano. I don't know what it was. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's great. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but it was. I, we used to talk about her all the time for some reason. I don't know why. I don't I don't know, but that's full disclosure. <laughs> okay. I might let her know that. I might, I, I might, we're still in very close contact with each other, so it's great that we can be outside of our, you know, <laughs> the, the environment of her being the coach. And she's like, call me Kathy. I'm like, no. Right. I'll never be able to call you Kathy. You are, will and always will be Coach Solano to me. Definitely, definitely. We got Chris says, Chris says, Donna was one of the nicest people when I got to Manhattan College. She's a class act. Now, that's coming from Smooth Beard. That's coming from the voice of the Jaspers. Thanks, Chris. I loved you guys. (laughs) Oh, man. Okay, so we talked about the recruiting process. So so that's the main reason why you chose Manhattan was because of Coach Solano. But you know about – did you know a lot about the history of Manhattan College before you decided to come there? Uh, I I did a little bit of research on it, so I know it was a Jesuit school, and Mm -hmm. it's so funny, Russ, I grew up as a Baptist, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so I knew it was a a small Jesuit school. I really liked the size of it. Um, Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure, honestly, what to expect. I was very naive as a, you know, 17, 18-year-old. I didn't, you know, back then we didn't have the internet either to really 
yep, dig into true. things and really get more, you know, um, information about stuff. So I really depended on the information that, that Coach Roan, as the recruiting coordinator, would send me and call me and talk to me about the school and, and, and what a what a phenomenal, obviously, business school and engineering school it is. Yeah. Um, and so I didn't – I wasn't able to do a whole lot of homework on it back then in, in 1986. So mm-hmm. obviously if I was being recruited today, it would be a lot different. Yeah. Um, but Definitely. the second I walked on campus and just saw the, the family atmosphere of Manhattan and, and the, the size of the campus and, and – and, um, where it was located, of course, being in New York was such a draw for me. I just, and it's always funny because my high school coach always thought that Jean Mooney, because we both got recruited, she, she went to Lehigh and played for Muffet McGraw for one year before she went to Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. Um, we both got recruited to Lehigh by Muffet, mm. and he totally thought that I would go to like a Lehigh and Jean would go to like a city school, and we we, <laughs> we were opposite. Right. Uh, but I would say that was the best thing for me because I was a very shy. I always like to say dorky because of my glasses. Um, <laughs> high school kid. Uh-huh. Um, and, and then going to Manhattan, it just really brought me out of my shell um, being in such a great place, you know? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Do, do you still keep in contact with fellow classmates and, and teammates as well throughout the, all these I do, years? I do. I'm still in touch with Annie to help me. Annie, uh, yes. Uh-huh. Um, Lisa Heaney, uh, okay. Leanne Walker a little bit. I was roommates with Leanne for a couple years. Um, Sandy Gordon, I, I, I was able to yes. stay in pretty close contact with um, because she coached for a long time at the college level, too, so I used to see her out on the recruiting trail. Mm-hmm. And I just got back in touch with somebody who I was so glad about is Missy Snyder, who was two years older than me. Okay. And I Ooh. finally got back in touch with her through Facebook, which is so great because Missy, Missy was one of my, like, closest friends when I was in college so it was really nice oh that's great um to to get back in touch with her oh okay that's super that's super we got Keisha joining us from the D what up though we got a lot of people from the D joining us here today I love it (laughs) I love it I absolutely love it hey so Donna so okay so we talk about your Manhattan College days so what was the feeling like winning two MAC championships and going to the tournament twice in your college career talk to me about the feeling about that because that that is amazing yeah, you know, my freshman year, it was like um, being new to the team. It didn't feel like it was quite my championship. Mm-hmm. I was a part of that championship team because I was a freshman. Right. Um, and so we, um, I mean, we played at Army, which mm-hmm. was great. It was one of the cleanest um, arenas I've ever seen in my entire life. Yes, so right. <laughs> single fingerprint on the backboard. Um, <laughs> and what, you know, a kind of ironic um you know, is, is uh, you know, you know, we played Holy Cross my freshman year. I think we, I'm trying to think who we played in the in the final game. It was either, I think it might have been LaSalle we beat in the final game. Mm-hmm. I can't remember. Gosh, it was so long ago. <laughs> but it was, I mean, winning any winning any championship, you know, yeah. was, being able to win it at the high school level gave yeah. me a taste of what it feels like to be at that level. So. Right. For us, again, we were never ranked number one. We were always middle of the pack at the MAC conference. Mm. So and and, and, and speaking about that, Don, and I'm sorry to cut you off, but speaking about that, do, do, are you aware that this ladies' women's basketball team at Hank Cos is preseason ranked number one? Were you aware of that yes, fact? I am, and I'm so proud of them. It's so awesome. It's that is so great. Fine. Yes, shout out to Coach V. I had her on the show a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I'm so happy for that program. I'm so happy for those yep, ladies. Yep. yep, well deserved. And I hope they can just, you know, I hope cross your fingers everything goes well and they can, they Play. can, you know, <laughs> sustain that throughout the season and then and then win another championship. Absolutely. Uh, My- Yep, my apologies for interrupting. Freshman you was, you was saying was like a part of it, and then mm-hmm. you know, by the time I became a senior, that was obviously a goal of right. mine. Was mm-hmm. you know, and our team was to, to win a MAC championship. Mm-hmm. So um, you know, we reached our goal. We we had our ups and downs during the season. Again, we weren't the number one seed going in there, but you know, Coach Roan, I remember him saying when we got down to Philadelphia because we played at LaSalle, mm-hmm. he goes. You know, I hope you packed for the whole time because we're going to be here till the very last game that we were. Nice. Oh man, that is major. That's major. Donna, what what player did you pattern your game after? Was there anybody like men, women, what have you? How how what? How did you pattern your game after that person? Or was that was that actual person like that for you? Well, my brother. Honestly, back then it was my brother. Okay. Um, you know, I don't I don't feel like I was into 
college basketball as much as I am now mm-hmm. and as I uh, as I was as a coach. Right. Um, so my brother um, was a very good basketball player, and you know. You know, I, I always got that I shot like a guy. My 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 mm-hmm. jump shot was like a guy, and well, I learned that from my brother. So I really a lot of my game was how my brother played. Mm-hmm. Uh, but players back then, Russ, honestly, I mean that was the era of Cheryl Miller. Cheryl Miller, you know, yes. So you know that was that was a great time. I actually my senior year went down to University of Maryland when USC was in town and saw her in the McGee Twins. Um, so they were the players back then that we had to look up to. Definitely. Uh, to really, you know, not that I really, you know, modeled my game after her, but her athletic ability and just being able to do what she did back then was, was such a, um, uh, uh, she was such a role model for us young girls back then. Yeah. Compared to what you have now, you know, you got Diana Taurasi, you got Maya Moore. Um, you had Lauren Jackson come over from Australia. Yeah. I mean, there's so many players right now that, that these girls have to look up to, yeah. which I think that, that, that really gives you a very good idea of where, that, where women's basketball has come. Absolutely. Where it used to be. Absolutely, absolutely. Donna, do you think, like, if you took your game and it was back then, do you think you can be able to, would you be able to play in this era when women's basketball today? Yeah, I think I could, and I think I would be probably a better player because I think the competition and the level of play is better than when I played in high school in the 80s. I think girls nowadays can create their own shots and can shoot off the dribble. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, now you got, um, you know, players that that are dunking that we never had that back in the day. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Um, and, And they're just more athletic, so that would make me have to be that much better of course uh Mm -hmm. but i feel like my overall knowledge of the game i could definitely compete and and i probably have to work a little bit harder from an athletic standpoint Mm -hmm. um to be at this level i mean this level is just so good now yeah um for these young girls and they're just so much better than they were and they're not playing with the men's ball like i did and they have a three-point line that i didn't have when i was in high school Wow, man. So if there was a three-point line in high school, you would have been really off the charts, scoring like well, maybe 2,000 points. Ball, but we played with the men's ball in high school. Wow, I didn't know that, man. Yeah, so when I became a freshman at Manhattan, that's when we went to the small ball, and that's when the three-point line came into play. Man, that is yeah. amazing. Man, oh, man. Yeah, and, and I, you know, you were a great player, Donna. And so, you know, great players, they, they adapt and they adjust to their surroundings and their environment, you know, like they – you know, like they say, like a guy like Akeem Olajuwon, could he play in this? Could he play in this era? Yeah, he play in this era. He probably adapt. He'll probably be shooting threes. <laughs> you know, so totally. yeah. So you you definitely adapt. You definitely adapt. We got James joining. What's going on, James? Welcome to Transition Tuesdays. We also have uh, Antonia uh, joining us. I think that's a newbie here. Welcome to Transition Tuesdays, and we also have Lawrence joining us. Welcome everybody to Transition Tuesdays. Appreciate having each and every one of you here today. So, Donna, talk to me about the prestigious honors that you have being a high school Hall of Famer, Manhattan College Hall of Famer, and a Mac Hall of Famer. Can you talk to me about each and every one of those prestigious honors that you have? Let's start with the high school one first. Talk to me about that that particular honor that you had. That's amazing. Well, that, you know, you know, getting into your high school Hall of Fame is, is always always a privilege it is it um, is I, i'm been fortunate I, i'm 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 lucky enough to be inducted in my high school hall of fame too yeah i know the feeling you're right yeah it, it's just you know because you had so much pride back then that's your high school you went to and and actually gene mooney who was the other player i've talked about quite a bit tonight who played at lehigh we both and our high school coach all got inducted into the collinswood hall of fame at the same time oh that's so great that just, yeah it was it was so thrilling to be doing that with the two of them um and it made it that much more special to me knowing that we we were in the trenches together mm-hmm. you know for the three years that i was at, at collingswood and and to to get that finally to that level was um it was just it was it, it was exhilarating to, to be able to do that you know mm-hmm. um and then what's interesting is is i actually got inducted into the manhattan college hall of fame before my high school hall of fame wow uh, so that's <laughs> Kind of funny. That's yeah, that kind of is. Cool. <laughs> high school Hall of Fames are funny anyway. That you know the way they, the classes that they induct. Like our high school team should be in 
Collins was High School Hall of Fame, but they're still in the 70s. Yo, so, yeah, they, they got to take care of the older people here. first. Yeah, the politics of it all. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, when I got into the Manhattan one, um, I was thrilled. I mean, again, you, you put in four years of your life. Yeah. Um, and, Russ, you can attest to this. You know what type of a coach Coach Solano was. There were times where we didn't get dinner because she worked us so hard and we went past the time yes. that we could go into the dining hall. Yep. <laughs> and we of English muffin pizzas in college and the good old oodles and noodles. <laughs> yes. Uh, but, you know, you put in all that hard work, and that that is just – it's a reward. I mean, to, and, and, you know, Coach Solano came back for it. Uh, my mom was there, my grandma, I had friends, my sister. I mean, it was just – it was so awesome, and I got got inducted with fellow uh, Keith Bullock was going in the same year. I oh, did. that's right! Yes, yes. yes. So, so awesome to see Keith at the same time. Yes. So that again is is great. But you know, when I think about um, the Mac Hall of Fame that I got inducted into, um, yeah. three, I think that was 2018, yeah. up at the um, you know the NBA Hall of Fame. Right. In, yeah. In mm-hmm. That was. It was it, the story was funny behind it because I kept having um, I can't remember his name. Somebody from Manhattan Athletic Department kept calling me, mm-hmm. <laughs> and it was a number I didn't know, so I didn't call, I didn't answer it. And then all of a sudden he left me a message. He's like, "I really need to talk to you. Could you please give me a call? It's an emergency." So I'm like, "Oh my gosh, what the heck's going on here?" <laughs> so I call him back, and he's like, "Yeah, um, you're getting inducted into the Mac Hall of Fame." I go, "Are you sure? Do you have the right person?" <laughs> when you think about the Mac conference there's so many players yeah so many phenomenal players Mm -hmm. that i played against that came before me that came after me right and that was truly russ one of the best honors i think i've ever received is is being going into that mac hall of fame Mm -hmm. um and then locally in this area for my high school days um i i got um inducted into the al carino basketball that it's the boys club of south jersey i got inducted into that um, two years ago, and then I got inducted into the Camden County Hall of Fame uh, <laughs> last year. So I've I've had the honor, really, of being inducted into some really um, outside of high school and college, some really um, incredible Hall of Fames to be a part of. Now that is amazing. That is so amazing, man. <laughs> We got Kathy joining us. Welcome, Kathy. Welcome to Transition Tuesdays. And Kathy, my apology, uh, my condolences on your dad. Uh, just want to let you know about that, man. This is man. This I mean, I, I, I t- help you because I got to tell you, yep. Russ, her and Andy mm-hmm. came to so many of those inductions, and I love them both to death. And yep. they're sweethearts, mm-hmm. and they are. Um, the most supportive friends I, I think I've ever had. Absolutely. Yep. And this is Kathy. Yep. Kathy Selensky. Yep. Uh-huh. Oh, man. That is amazing. Yep. It's good to have friends. Yep. Oh, man. Yep. That is perfect. That's perfect. Hey, so, so Donna, so, okay, so all these Hall of Fame accolades, man, you, you have you have all your awards. You have to get, like, a U-Haul truck to get them back home. <laughs> <laughs> it's awards, man. Oh, man. Luckily, Russ, they give out plaques now, and you can hang them on the wall. Right. <laughs> they don't have to be right. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. We got Amy joining us too. Another Manhattan College finest joining us, coming out for Don. I tell you, this Woo, is some good stuff. <laughs> so let me just see. Let's take a look now. Okay, so great coach. I mean, great playing career. So now you transition to coaching. So talk to me a little bit, Donna, about what did you like about coaching and what did you dislike about coaching. Let's start with the likes first. Yeah, I mean, you, you know. Back then, Russ, when I graduated college back in the 90s, you get into coaching, mm-hmm. certainly not for the pay um, right. back then. Yes. You know, it's a lot different now. But um, mm-hmm. I knew my last game, we played Clemson in the NCAA tournament my senior year. I knew after that I wanted to stay in basketball somehow. Mm-hmm. Um, I was lucky enough to go over to Ireland for a year and play professionally over there after Manhattan. Oh, you did? How was that experience so, before you go to coaching? Yeah. What's that? How, how was that experience playing overseas for that year? That was that was a phenomenal experience. Okay. Um, I, it was. I, I actually lived with um, uh, this girl Karen Hennessy, who played at Iona. Wow. So I actually already knew her, thank goodness, uh-huh. <laughs> um, because I played against her when she played at Iona. So I lived with her family, and um, the team was called the West Coast Coolers, and we we played in the whole surrounding area. I lived in Dublin. Mm-hmm. I actually. Where I got the taste for coaching, Russ, was while I was there in, in Ireland, I coached 
So we were the A team in this West Coast Cooler Club. Uh -huh. Then we had a B team and a C team. I coached our C team, and then I coached <laughs> two high school teams as well while I was over there. Wow. So <laughs> you did all that? Yeah, yeah. I, well, my job was to play, and, and, and while I wasn't playing, I had to do something, right? Right. Absolutely. Um, yep. <laughs> so I, I had the pleasure of coaching two high school teams, and that just gave me the, the taste and, and, and the desire to coach. So... When I came back from Ireland, um, I, I had the you know the opportunity to go down to a uh, Final Four in New Orleans, and that was you know my senior year was when Loyola came into the MAC conference. Okay. So I was able to interview with Frank Zemanski at the time, um, and get, he gave me the job, which was great. I had a choice between Loyola or Canisius. Canisius was a grad assistant job. Okay. And I decided, look, I need a full time job, so I went with Loyola and oh. ended up staying down there and. What I really enjoyed about coaching was, was, was what I got out of, you know, a, as a player, what I got out of was learning mm -hmm. from my coaches. Mm -hmm. um, so as a coach, what I really enjoyed was the teaching part um, to the players and, and, and yeah. the, the satisfaction of knowing that when they came to, whether it was Loyola or Indiana State, their freshman year, by the time they were leaving, mm -hmm. My goal was to make them not only a better player, but a better person and to be ready to go out into the real world, which is what I experienced. Right, definitely. Uh, I loved, obviously, the competition. I mean, as, a, as a, an athlete, you, if you don't have competition in your life, you feel lost. No doubt. You know, that's kind of where my sales, what I do now, I, there's competition. Yep. You know, you, mm -hmm. you got rankings, you know, who's going to be number one in the country for sales? Yep. <laughs> so I still have that in this job, but... You know, the coaching and the individual workouts that I did with all the players, but the camaraderie of being a part of a family yeah. um, mm -hmm. is what I really, really enjoyed about coaching. And that's why I did it for 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, what I didn't like about it, um, by the end of my career when I was coaching, things were really starting to change from a recruiting standpoint. And, and now looking, I, I finished coaching in 2002. You look at social media now uh -huh. and the way these players are coached, um, or I'm sorry, are recruited is very different than how they were, were how I had to recruit. Right. And, mm -hmm. and I'm kind of glad I got out when I did because I don't know if I could do the, the texting and the Twitter and the Facebook and all that stuff that I think coaches have to do nowadays. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I loved the conversations on the phone where they got to know me, I got to know them. So that was probably the biggest thing when I was leaving was the players, the kids were changing a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, I worked my tail off because I needed to, to earn that scholarship. And I feel like, I felt like when I was leaving coaching that, that, that I felt like sometimes the kids were not appreciating mm -hmm. the scholarship that they got where they were getting a free education and they didn't have one student loan to pay back. Mm -hmm. But yet they still had their hands out saying, what else are you going to give me? Wow. Yeah, they wanted more. They wanted some more along with that scholarship. It wasn't enough. <laughs> exactly. And and so, but I did it for 10 years, and I, I still keep in touch with a lot of the players that I had the opportunity to coach at both Loyola and at Indiana State. Mm, that's cool. Now, Donna, a question for you. So, if you had the opportunity to coach, maybe coach at your alma maters in both high school and college, would you would you take that opportunity to do so? High school, no, Russ. Uh, <laughs> I, can't, I can't coach a high school team because, you, you know, um, when I played, our team was very different. We all really, like, loved playing basketball, and yeah. and we were good. Right. Um, I don't. I couldn't coach a high school team where there might be just one player and the other players are there just for the social gathering yeah. of it. Right. <laughs> um, college is different. I could definitely go back to my alma mater at Manhattan and I could definitely coach at the college level mm -hmm. because then they, those are the players that I would want to coach because they know what I'm talking about, you know, as, yeah. as a coach and, and I'm setting up plays and, you know, working on different aspects of their game. Mm -hmm. um, that would be, I would get more out of that high school. I would not enjoy it. Right. College. I would, I would definitely go back and, and, and coach college. Cool. Cool. All right. We got the Silver Fox, George Servi, joining us. Welcome, George. And we also got Stephanie joining us. We got Mimi's sister. You remember Mimi, Greedy? Of course I do. Yes. yes. Our sister Stephanie's on it. What's up, Stephanie? I haven't seen Stephanie in years. Welcome, everybody, to Transition Tuesdays. Oh, man. That is awesome. Man, okay. So, coaching aspects. So, you did coaching for 10 years. You talked about your likes and your dislikes. So, 
let's talk about now what, what you're doing now. So talk to us about, you know, you your sales career with Lily and Company. You know, how, how long have you been there, Donna? So April, this April, Russ, will be my 19th year at, at Eli Lilly and Company. Wow. Um, so I started in 2002 there, and I was very lucky um, at the time. Um, uh, I knew the person. We, we used to have a referral system at Eli Lilly, mm-hmm. and luckily the um, my ex my ex partner that I had, uh, her sister in law, mm-hmm. was working at the Eli Lilly. And when I left Indiana State, she's like, "What are you going to do now?" I'm like, "I really have no idea." So I I moved back to the East Coast, thinking if I want to stay in coaching. Mm-hmm. I got to go back where I have all my contacts on the East Coast. And when I got back here, um, she's like, look, there's a job at Eli Lilly. Why don't you give it a try? It's a lot of what you do. Because what I do, Russ, is very similar to what I did as a coach. Just take the basketball aspect out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I used to cold call high school coaches and have to talk. You know, I actually enjoy talking to 17- and 18-year-old girls more than I enjoy talking to the doctors that I have to talk to now. (laughs) Um, But uh, a lot of it is, is, is... developing the relationships, being able to earn their trust for yep. them to believe in my products that I sell. And I had to do the same thing as a coach. So mm-hmm. there was a lot of overlap. So that's how I got into pharmaceutical sales 19 mm-hmm. years ago. Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and I tell people all the time, a lot of, a lot of corporate, you know, corporate companies, they want to hire former athletes because they have, you know, number one, you have that competitive gene that you never lose, you know. So you have that, you know, you know about camaraderie, teamwork. You know, and just working with people and individuals. So I think a lot of times you'll find athletes, you know, joining on with other corporate companies. Totally. And they love it because you have that that self-motivation Yep. Um, that not everybody has. Mm-hmm. Uh, and believe me, I use my athletic ability a lot in the Philadelphia area because we've got the worst Philadelphia Eagles fans yeah. um, <laughs> in the world, right? We've got the worst fans. Um, but I use that a lot to develop some of the relationships with my customers when I know they're into athletics and sports. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I use it. I say, hey, I played college ball and blah, blah, blah. And, mm-hmm. um, it really helps. And you you nailed it, Russ. Corporations want play, you know, they want employees. They want to hire the best people. And look, you are giving one athlete. You yeah. can't get any better than that. Right. Definitely. Nah, that that's so true. That is so true. Man. So at Eli Lilly and Company, uh, you've been doing that. You're doing great there. And I know you're putting up Hall of Fame numbers like, you know, you've been doing in basketball. So I'm sure you've been doing that for 19 years, just putting up Hall of Fame stats and numbers. <laughs> I've had some good years, Russ, yeah. <laughs> I, not all of them, of course. Not all of them. You know how sales are. So absolutely. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. I, you know, I learned, you know, when I when I worked for Jostens for 15 years, yep, it's, you know, it's... <laughs> It's up and down, the roller coaster, but it's a great roller coaster ride to be on, you know, with sales. Yeah, it is. You know, yep. It definitely is. So, Don, I got two more questions for you, right? So, yeah. here's my first one. What is your biggest accomplishment up to date right now? To date. Like, what do you think is your biggest accomplishment? I mean, you have accomplished a lot of things. Hall of Famer, scoring champion, doing this and that, you know, sales exec, all of this. But what do you think is your biggest accomplishment to date? Um, wow, that's a tough one, Russ. Why'd you save that for last? Uh, I got, that's what I do here. That's what I do here, Don. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say, I, I would say my, my biggest accomplishment, um, is, is, is who I am today mm-hmm. because of my athletic background. Right. Um, I, I would not be where I am today without, with, without athletics. Mm-hmm. And to be able to say that, um, and to be where I am today, the success that I've had, um, in, in, in this industry um, is, is all due to what I was able to do as an athlete. Yes. Um, and, and to really have that self-discipline and that, that self-motivation and the work ethic to get me to where I am today. And, um, you know, I run into a lot of people in my field who are very, very different than I am, yeah. um, aren't as, as competitive as I am. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's, that's, you know, your younger years will determine what your older years are going to be like. And I feel like, you know, all that, that work that I put in as an athlete through high school and college um, and then as a coach. And, you know, you got to be able to adapt to different environments, too, that you're in. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I feel like the, what, the person I am today is, is probably my biggest accomplishment. 
compared to all the accolades that I've had in my life because I, you know, I'm a very modest person. I don't talk about them unless they're brought up. Right, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I know. I know how you are, Donna. Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I can, I do like, I, I, I feel good talking about who I am as a person, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And I feel like I accept everybody for who they are, no matter, you know, what your religious background is, what your ethnicity is, who you love. Mm-hmm. Um we all need to love each other, yes. and and that's the most important thing. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, Don, I'm gonna leave you with this last question here. Now, this is the good one here. We got Chris Finley joining. What's going on, Chris? Welcome to Transition Tuesdays. Love having you. So, Donna, if you can have dinner with a famous person, be it living or one who has passed away or transitioned, who would that person be, and why? Well, I would have to say, um, it's funny you say this, Russ, because it, I feel so like I've, I've been thinking about that more okay. in the environment that we're in right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but probably it, it, probably a couple years ago, it probably would have been Hillary Clinton, because I feel like as a woman, mm-hmm. you know, I know she's not the most liked woman in the world, but she is one of the most accomplished women in the world. Absolutely. A couple years ago, it probably would have been her, but um, more recently... I would have to say Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Wow. Okay. Um, why? Why? Ruth? Why? Why? Why the notorious LGBT? <laughs> well, because she's notorious. I mean, think yeah. about what she, she accomplished as a woman. Yeah. Um, being the first woman, um, you know, to the, I think she was the first woman to the Supreme Court. Uh huh. Um, so. yeah. But just what she was able to overcome, and what she, how she was able to create change. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And to con- continue to do that for so many years. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I just think she, you know, she was still working out in her 80s, and she was still as sharp as anything. Yes. Before she passed. Definitely. And we were hoping she was just going to hold on until after January 20th. We were praying. I know. Um, yes. Yes. Absolutely. But, um, I, and she's just. She's just. She's a. She's just such a role model for women. Mm-hmm. Um, all ages, you know, all yeah, ages. Definitely. And what she accomplished as a woman in in what technically is a man's world. Yep. Um, yeah. Is, is, she was just an amazing woman. I would love to sit down and because I think she would probably actually be very funny as well. Yeah, definitely, right? <laughs> My sense of humor, and I love that. Yeah, definitely. You know, I liked about her too. I admired about her because I I got a chance to see her story. I think CNN ran a piece on her. And the love she had for her husband and like how her, yeah. how her husband really took a back seat to, you know, to let her really succeed and let her rock out and what she was doing. I, I, I really admired that. I, I really admired that with her. Totally agree. Yeah. Yep. 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 Totally agree. Mm-hmm. Well, Donna, it has been a pleasure catching up with you, Donna. Again, I, I can't wait, you know, when it's COVID-19, all this stuff subsides and stuff like that. I would love to see you at a women's game because I know I'm going to be going to the games this year. And again, I could be sitting with you and I could be pointing to the person, you know, this. the reason why Manhattan College is successful now is players like Donna Siva who, you know, who were there before him, who paved the way, who are legends, you know, in the presence of, of you know, of great things. So, you know, I look forward to, you know, seeing you again, Donna. We're going to definitely okay. talk. And I know you don't do these things often, so I appreciate you coming on the show today. I really do. Thank you, Ross. It was awesome talking to you, catching up, and I hope to get to see you real soon. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks again, Don. Appreciate you. Okay, thanks. See you okay. later. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. That was Donna Sebo. Oh, my God. She is a Manhattan College basketball legend. All right. Great stories, too. Absolutely great, great stories. Man, oh, man. Now, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, I want to talk about, you know, we transition. That's what we do here after the interviews. We'll talk about a transition. And I want to talk about something that that has occurred to me, and I just want to get everybody else's response on it because maybe I just want to make sure I'm not crazy. I want to talk about uh, the topic of catfishing. All right? Now, I'm an older guy, so I had to look up what, you know, I heard about catfishing and what it is. So I had to look up this word catfishing. And catfishing is, a catfish is someone who uses false information to cultivate a persona online that does not represent their true identity. So I looked up this word catfishing, and 
And again, guys, I you know I, I'm just trying to get some insight and, and information on this. This past week, I felt like I was the victim of catfishing twice. All right, so I mean it's really weird. I you know I got contacted by a person online, and uh, they sent me you know they sent a picture, and then they talking up. I have one person who sent me kind of like a six page paragraph type message. <laughs> paragraph about you know them and getting together and something like this so i just want to know you know <laughs> i don't know again i'm i'm new to this game about this but you know i just want to know is this a am i a victim of catfishing here or or i ask you guys have you guys ever been catfished um is this is this something or is this something i should be on the midst about, you know, really be aware about, or, or is it just me? Am I hallucinating? I don't know. Just, you know, I just want to just put, just want to put that out there. Have you ever been catfished or, you know, what is that all about? Cause again, I, I'm new to this, this dating game type of deal. You know, like, you know, if you guys don't know my history, I was married for fi over 15 years, uh, divorced for a year, but, um, you know, this has taken place and, uh, I just want to know more about it. I mean, what's the, what's the deal with this man you know it's, it, it got me thinking you know it's i was thinking about the movie friday when the guy big worm said man you play with my emotions Smokey." i mean i don't want, like my emotions to be played with i just want to make sure i'm not being played with this catfishing thing I, I the the most famous catfishing thing that i can think of was i remember the player from notre dame i forget his name's a football player i forget his name but i know he was he was catfished like over a year with a lady who he never met, but he had an ongoing online relationship with a lady he never met before. And he got catfished, it turned out. So I'm just trying to learn more about this catfishing deal. Um, should I stay engaged in this conversation? I don't know. Should I just be aware? I just block this person? I don't know. I need some help. Somebody can help me. Hopefully somebody can help me out there. Hopefully someone can help me. <laughs> and Chris says, uh, what's up, Russ? Hope everything is well with you and your family. That's Chris Finley talking about that. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that, my man. Thank you so much. So, just wanted to talk about that. Have you ever been catfish? Or have you ever been doing, have you ever done the catfishing? I don't know if you're going to probably admit to that, but, or you might know somebody who has done catfishing. I like to know these people because I like to know. I mean, I like to know the ways of catfishing so I can see how I can maneuver, you know, during this. And Chris says, get out. <laughs> All right. So, Chris, so you say I should just don't 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 engage with this with this person. OK, I, I take your advice there, Chris, because, uh, you know, I, with this catfishing, do I do a little snooping, a little little P.I. work, you know, a little Barney B. Jones. Remember that Barney B. Jones? <laughs> as, as Leah says, that's a that's a whole show. Yes, yes, that's true. What's up, Leah? Welcome to Transition Tuesdays. Yes, I remember that show on um I think it was MTV Catfish or Catfishing. Yes, oh my god, it's it's quite entertaining. Yes, I would imagine, but I do not want to be on that show. So that's why I'm just trying to reach out to the public and let them know what should I do. Should I block these people who who I think are catfishing me? Should I be engaged? What do you guys think? I don't know. I, that's why I wanted some feedback, but. So let's do this as well while we're pondering that. Uh, last week, I forgot to mention, last week, the passing of Jeopardy's Alex Trebek. I forgot to mention that last week, so I want to talk about bringing it to light today. And uh, I wasn't aware, but he hosted Jeopardy for 37 years. And I know my mom and dad, my mom to this day, my mom watches Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune, but Jeopardy first for all these years. She always watches it, man. So... You know, uh, man, shout out to Alex Trebek, man. Rest in peace to Alex Trebek. And Leah says, so you know the end result. Get out. That's right. <laughs> All right. I'll go with you and the hubby there, Leah. No doubt about it. Okay. I won't even get involved. I won't be, be engaged with the process. I got you. <laughs> I got you. I got you. So, Alex Trebek, 37 years as the host of Jeopardy. My my thought process was I had a conversation. I sit down with my mom about Alex Trebek, and I thought that I think the show should end because Alex Trebek was that much of a staple for Jeopardy. That was my opinion. But my mom said, "No, no, the show must go on. We got to get another host, and we got Donna joining us. What's going on, Donna? 
Great interview today, Donna. I appreciate you, my love. Thank you so much. <laughs> so with Alex Trebek, so my mom, I'm I'm on this the 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 belief that the show should be canceled. I mean, you can't you can't replace a legend like an Alex Trebek, me personally. But my mom thinks the show must go on. So people have been talking about this and they've been saying possible replacements for Alex Trebek. You have one Laval Burton who was on Reading Rainbow back in the days, and he also played Kuta Kente, man, in Roots. You know, he's I know he's lobbying for the position. He's definitely doing that. Uh, let's see what Chris says. Chris Finley, Chris Finley says, back in the late 90s, I lived in Raleigh, uh, web TV chat rooms. The women who made it, oh, we talk about oh, catfish, okay. The women who made it to, made it to the meet and greet stages were never who they presented themselves to be. I learned that lesson back then. That he says, leave it alone, brother. All right. <laughs> All right, Chris. Those are three to get out. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the advice of my people, my transition army. I'm going to leave that be. I'm going to just let that, that catfishing deal, let them fish fry somewhere else with that. Okay, I'm with you, Chris. Thank you, man. Thank you, Chris, so much on that. <laughs> so getting back to... A possible replacement for Alex Trebek on Jeopardy. So you got Laval Burton. I know people have had like a um, a signage, you know, talking about if he gets like a number of uh, signatures. I think it's like 150,000 signatures. That might he might be in the running to be the next host on Jeopardy. I know you get uh, the former show champion Ken Jennings. He might be another guy to replace Alex Trebek on Jeopardy. That might be a good choice. You also have ABC News um, chief anchor George Stephanopoulos. He might be in the running. And then here's a dark horse in which uh, this particular lady, Alex Trebek, he had once had an interview and he said he would like to see this person replace him when he was done um, hosting Jeopardy. And that CNN anchor, Laura Coates. A lot of people don't know about that. Laura Coates, that would probably be a good one. That'd be a very good one. So, again, I, it got me thinking. Oop, hold on one second. Uh -oh. What happened there? Okay, there we go. Uh, Chris, Chris Finley says, I'm sure it's the same for, uh, I'll, well, I'm, let me just make sure I read this correctly. Let's get my glasses together. I'm sure it's the same for our sisters out there. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. This is true about the catfish. We're going back to the catfish. Yep. It's a lot of catfishing out there. I just don't want to be involved with it. Nah, that's definitely true. <laughs> so we're talking about Laura Coates. So Laura Coates. This is on the strength of Alex Trebek. He is one he interviewed and he said Laura Coates would be a great replacement for Alex Trebek. So it got me thinking. So I got, you know, talking to my mom and it got me thinking maybe the show should go on. And it got me thinking who I think will be the ideal host for Jeopardy going forward. And I think that person would be. Now again, don't think I'm crazy, but hear me out. I think the person to host Jeopardy now could be Samuel L. Jackson. I can see Samuel L. Jackson doing a great job as host of Jeopardy, especially if they got the questions wrong. I'm sure he'll probably get at them and all that good stuff. It'll probably be a must-watch deal. You know, I would definitely tune in to see Jeopardy if if uh, if Samuel J. Samuel J. Samuel L. Jackson. I was going to say Samuel J. <laughs> Samuel L. Jackson hosted. Jeopardy, I think he could pull it off. I think he could do it. But again, what do you guys think? Who do you think will be a good replacement for Alex Trebek on Jeopardy? Who do you think might be that person? All right. <laughs> something to ponder, something to think about. Catfishing and a new host of Jeopardy. All right. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, if, I was, if we were able to make you laugh, smile and think during this broadcast here today my good friends you have accomplished something major today so celebrate your victory celebrate your victory as i'm gonna play my theme song as we head on out here hey ladies and gentlemen i just want to thank you all for watching transition tuesdays this week from the bottom of my heart i thank you so so much thank you so much i appreciate you guys um, you guys can always follow me on Instagram at R Will Transitions. You can always follow me there. And also, if you haven't got the book, 
I know you got it, but again, transition game plan, simple steps to achieving personal success. You can get my book, get a second book, get a third, pass them out. You can get that at Amazon.com. We'd love to have you guys do that. Um, Again, if you want a signed copy, I can always get that to you. You can just inbox me. I can get a signed copy to you. Love to do that. Be a part of your collection. And speaking of collections, and speaking of books, new book out today. New book out today. You have President Barack Obama, A Promised Land. That comes out today. It's going to talk about his first term in the White House. I can't wait to get my copy. I'm going to get a copy soon as we get off here. I'm going to get an e-book probably. But again, I'm going to get my copy. I recommend you guys do that as well. Talks about his first term in the White House. And again, that's just, just the first book. So I know it's going to be other books as well. But A Promised Land comes out today by the president, number 44, President Barack Obama. That comes out today. And also, I'll be remiss. Donna, I want to thank you for coming on the show today. I uh, appreciate it. We had a great time. I had a blast talking to you about the bass and everything. And again, you got it. Everybody out there, you got to know your past before you can concentrate on your future. And players like Donna Siebel were people who like really paved the way for success at Manhattan College. So I appreciate you, Donna. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate that. Appreciate it, appreciate it, appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, as we always say in party, happy transitioning. We'll talk to you soon. Take care, everybody.